So we believe when God sees us having fun, he enjoys that too. This morning we're going to take a look uh, at why we're here. What was God thinking when he created something called the church? And what is our focus? What should our attention be on? And so we're going to look at what the early church looked like briefly, and then we're going to look at what Jesus had uh, intended in a conversation he had with his closest followers about it. And so um, I'd like us to go to Acts, the second chapter this morning, and it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we get an insight into what the early church focused on. And if you've looked at the backside of your notes, you'll see that there are a few more blanks than usual, and you're probably already worried if you will ever get out of here this morning. And what I would tell you is be very afraid. Uh, we know, no. no. Um, the, the early church engaged in the power of learning, the power of learning, because they didn't assume that they knew it all. One of the things that they realized is that even if something defeats you today because of something that you can learn, tomorrow can be a very different outcome. That we are a work in progress and that God actually transforms us to be more conformed to the image of his son. And so we learn. We understand that God uh, has, has come to help us learn how life actually works and how he's designed it. And so they engaged in the power of learning. They also engaged in the power of love. You have to understand that everything that God does is motivated from a heart of love. And as it turns out, uh, love only really works well in certain environments. It, it doesn't survive well in environments of selfishness and greed. But it works really well in environments of serving and sacrifice. When you look at the life of Jesus, the miracles that he performed are actually the moments when God is serving others. And when you see Christ on the cross, you see the sacrifice that God is willing to make. And as a result of the demonstration of his power and his sacrifice, we know that God loves us. So that engaging in the power of love, very, very uh, influential. And then it's also the power of prayer. That every single person has the privilege of talking to the most powerful and most loving being in all the universe. And when you have conversations like that, it's like the resources of heaven are able to invade our world. And people who have those conversations begin to discover that anything is possible. And then there's the power of worship. It said that they were filled with awe. They all were amazed and filled with awe at what God was doing among them. And that caused them to release worship. It would say later on in that same passage that they engaged in praise. Worship is an expression of awe, and it's an acknowledgement of the character of God. And here's our challenge. Sometimes we equate the difficulties of our life, and we think it, it illustrates a deficiency in the character of God, that because my life is hard, maybe God is not good. And God never promised us that we, our days would have no pain or no difficulty or no burdens to bear. He just simply promised that no matter what, he would never, ever, ever abandon us to all of those things, but rather he would walk with us through those things. And every one of those things is a temporary thing, that they will not last forever. So there's the power of worship, and then there's the power of unity, that there's this idea that, um, well, you've heard the expression, right, divide and conquer. Uh, it's, it's a well-known idiom in our world is that if you, if you are able to bring division to people, then they're easier to conquer. So Jesus brings to us the power of unity, which means that when we have problems, he will share wisdom so that we can solve them. And when we have conflict, he will help us engage in conversations so that we can resolve them. Unity is not all about having the same preference. Let's just check this morning. How many here like sushi? How many here do not like sushi? 
I've tried it, and I'm not saying you shouldn't eat it, but it is not for me. And I actually, I, I don't like tofu either. I tried it. If you ever see me eating tofu, it will be an indication to you how close to starvation I actually am at that moment. <laughs> And I had it at a really good restaurant, so if it was ever going to taste good, it had to be there. Good to me. Now, it's absolutely amazing how many people, when it comes to the church, turn it into a war of preferences. And here's what I want you to understand. Unity does not mean that we all prefer the same thing. Unity simply means that we're all on the same mission. Of course, we, our, our staff got together for lunch this last week, and so uh, somebody started the question, what are your five favorite music albums, and, and who's your favorite artist? And I did not know 80% of the people they were talking about. <laughs> I've never heard of them. For a half a minute, I thought they were talking in tongues, and I was waiting for the interpretation. <laughs> And if I told them who I liked, which I couldn't think of anybody right then because I was so distracted by the fact that I am clearly out of the loop, uh, if I told them who it was that I liked, they probably would have never heard of them. It's just, so who's right? And the answer is it's not a right or wrong thing. It's just a preference thing. The church in India doesn't look like the church in China, doesn't look like the church in Africa, doesn't look like the church in Europe, doesn't look like the church in the United States. That as soon as we turn what church should be in terms of our preference, we take it off mission. And this is not about preference, it's, it's, it's about mission. And so they engaged in the power of unity and they engaged in the power of generosity because nothing in our world, including us, is changed by selfishness or greed. Our world can actually be transformed by generosity. When we share, it shows that we trust God. And when we share, it discloses our heart to other people. It's an incredibly powerful thing, the power of generosity and the power of consistency. They determined that they would meet regularly with each other. They understood the kinds of things that can happen when, uh, in us and, and uh, to us when we become isolated and dislocated from one another. And we can become very discouraged. And then they also engaged in the power of joyfulness. The church was known as a happy place. Wouldn't that be great if that was the church's reputation today in our world? We were known for being a happy place. It said they had glad and sincere hearts. When they would see you walk into the room, their automatic response was a smile, not an eye roll. And uh, they were glad to see you. And they understood something. They understood that when they came together, we could learn from each other, and we could receive from each other, and we could encourage each other. And here's the thing. Some of us, uh, some of us might wake up on a morning and go, I'm actually in good shape. I feel pretty encouraged today. I think I'll just skip out of church. I don't, I don't need to be there. I'm good. And what I would tell you is, come because there are lots of people who aren't encouraged, and you can share some of that encouragement with them. And then maybe you're the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and says, I just feel so discouraged. I don't want to go and rain on anybody else's parade. I don't want to bring them down. And I would just say, come into the room because there are other people who are encouraged and they've come to share that encouragement with you. It's a very powerful thing when, when we're known for our joyfulness. And this produced two things. When, the, when they engaged in the power of all these things, it produced two things. And the first is they had favor with others. The Bible said they actually had favor with all the people. Now, there were certainly institutions that didn't like Christianity. The government was intimidated by it, and other religious systems were suspicious of it. But people themselves had a good opinion of the church because they engaged in the power of all of these things and it produced a growing family. You have to realize that the, the meeting spaces for Christians in those days was smaller than what we have right now. On the day of Pentecost, that room that they gathered in was full and had less people than we have in this room right now. And we're told that on the first day of the church that over 3,000 people found their way to the grace of God and placed their faith in the Son of God. And so the church grew exponentially on that very first day, and it continued to grow every day after. And it created all kinds of logistical challenges and nightmares for people to be able to continue to meet. But this is what's fascinating. There's a phrase that they use to describe that growth. And I think it's really powerful for us to hear. It said, they considered it as the Lord adding to the church. 
Their identity wasn't threatened by different people coming in. Their identity was actually revealed by different people coming in. And they actually considered every person coming to faith and grace, they considered that to be someone that, that God brought to them. And so the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. That brings us to this passage of Scripture in Matthew 16, where Jesus actually identifies what he's going to do with this institution called the church. And when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. I think that's really interesting because Jesus is asking if they have been paying attention to what other people think about him who are not yet believers. That's not a question you would expect Jesus to ask, and it's not one that's commonly asked today. But what do you say, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Now he narrows it to get to their opinion. And Simon Peter answered, you have to love Peter. Peter was the guy who wasn't afraid to look like an idiot. He would rather go first than not be heard at all. My favorite passage in the Bible about Peter is when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he sees Jesus transfigured into this supernatural being. And this is what it said. Peter did not know what to say. So he said, <laughs> that's Peter. <laughs> He's never without words. You can't catch that guy in a silent moment. Everyone else is quiet. He speaks up. But every once in a while, he gets it exactly right. And he says, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You didn't learn this from other people. But by my Father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. It's a great passage, and what we see here, to, what this teaches us to begin with, is that Jesus is actually the owner and the builder of the church. Jesus is the owner and the builder of the church. It wasn't some people's idea on what to do with groups it wasn't an idea that some men had so that they could increase their importance and access resources and, and control other people's behavior. That was not what it was about at all. To be sure, in Christian history, there have been some people who found their way into leadership with those designs, but that's not what the church was about, and that's not the way it is everywhere. Jesus understood that he was building something that was to relay and display the heart of his Father. So the leaders of our church actually do not consider our, that, that we own this church. We don't think we own this thing. We were doing a, a children's event in the summer, and there was one little boy whose behavior had gotten to the point that he got some one-on-one -on -one time with me. <laughs> that should tell you something, okay? And uh, so he, he had behaved in such a way that he'd gone through multiple helpers and multiple teachers, and they didn't know what to do, and so they called me in as though, like, I'm the guru on children who don't want to be here. And so I took him outside, and we sat down on, on the front step, and, and he looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, who owns this stupid church? <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, excuse me? He said, who owns this stupid church? And I said, yeah, we don't, we don't use the word stupid here. And he said, well, who owns this stupid church? And I said, yeah, we still don't use that word. And if you want an answer to your question, you have to take that word out. And he says, okay, who owns this church? <laughs> it's hard to be smarter than a kid. You just can't be. And, uh, and I explained to him that it isn't owned by a person. That all through the world, in communities of every generation, every continent, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, that God has raised up people so that they could come to learn more of his love and his grace. We don't, we don't own this thing. We're stewards of the things and the people that God cares a lot about. 
And just like if you entrusted something valuable or entrusted one of your kids to someone, you would want them to take the very best care because they would recognize how important that is to you. And that's what the church is in the world today. God raises up leaders not to own something, but to take care of the things that God loves so much and the people that God loves so much. So the ch Jesus is the owner and he is the builder of the church. And Jesus actually began his question with a teaching, which I mentioned earlier. It just, he says, what does the culture around you say about me? And they knew the answer, which means they had been having conversations that quite honestly a lot of religious people try to avoid. And then he narrows the field and he says, what do you think about me? Who do you say that I am? And it's not because Jesus is an insecure leader and he needs to know that, that they're, tr they're supporting and that they're loyal to him. That's not why he asked the question. God understands something very powerful, and we should understand it too, and that is that the things that we believe determine the actions that we take. We become like what we worship. And so Jesus drives the question home, not because he wants to feel better about himself or to do a loyalty check on those who are his closest followers. He wants to know, what is it that's on the inside of you? Because that's going to determine the kind of actions that you take in your future. And, and here's the thing. I've seen people who have done something that was different than what they've said, but I've never met the person who's taken an action that was different from what they actually believe. People are incredibly consistent in that regard. When they do something, it's because they believe something. And so they act consistently with that. So Jesus is assessing where they are in that. And this is what is surprising to us. Why does, he, why does he go that route? And it's because of this very simple truth. The key to discovering who you are is to learn who God is. That since he's the one who created us, we really won't understand ourselves until we learn more about him. And you actually see this dynamic lived out in the text, right? So this is what he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, because God was able to show you who I am, I can now tell you who you are. The same God who showed Peter who Jesus was showed Jesus who Peter really is. And you, Peter, are a rock. You're a solid guy. We're going to be able to build on you. You're foundational in the purposes of things that I'm doing in this world today. And this is why it's so important. The more we learn about God, the more we discover who he has created us to be. So the voices in our culture may have very varying opinions about who Jesus is. And quite honestly, I would say overall, the church in general is not held in the highest regard. But I would say that happens when we get distracted from our mission, when we turn things into preference wars. The world doesn't have much of a favorable opinion of us. But when we begin to lean into and focus on the things that Jesus said were important, it makes all the difference in the world. Then he shows us a picture. And we're honestly not often prepared for this picture. It's not how we talk about church in religious circles. But he says the church is actually an invasion force on a rescue mission. We're an invasion force on a rescue mission. I met a young man a couple weeks ago who serves in special forces for the army. And uh, he's highly trained. And he goes on missions solo for up to one to two weeks at a time in a part of the world that none of us would ever want to be in. His life is in jeopardy, and I don't know what he's responsible to take care of, though I can imagine, and he's not allowed to tell us where he's been or what he has done. But when he goes on a mission, he understands his mission. So what do you think our mission is? And What we are is we're an invasion force on a rescue mission. Jesus describes it this way. He tells us that the gates of hell will not be able to overcome or prevail against the church. Now, this is a really interesting thing because most of us see the church as the one who has gates and we're trying to keep the evil and the darkness out. We gather in rooms like this and we, and we try to huddle together and hope that there's some kind of of dark part of our culture doesn't lay hold and make claim on us and turn us into something we don't want to be. And so we become very huddled up. And that's not the picture of the church at all. Jesus says it's actually 
the kingdom of hell, which is fascinating because he says that hell is, is, is way more than just a place that people go to that don't want God in their lives, that it's actually a kingdom of evil and that it has a leader and it's like a city that has walls and gates and gates are super important in any city in the ancient world. It actually did two essential things. The first is, is it inhibited traffic flow. So once the date, gates were closed, nobody got in, nobody got out. You'd have to wait till the next morning. So once the gates were closed, no one could get in, no one could get out. The second thing about gates is that in the ancient world, that's where all the leaders of the city and the respected elders of the city would gather and they would make their plans and their strategic developments for the health and the well-being of the city. So they may get together and decide that we need to increase our agricultural capacity. And so there's some fields over here and we can marshal some resources to get those developed. Or maybe they were aware that there was an enemy nearby and so they would gather together and, and, and make plans to make sure their walls were reinforced and that their men were trained for military combat and that the weapons were available. This is where all the strategies and all the plans and, and, and all the things that they were going to undertake were, were considered discussed and decided was at the city gates. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying hell is like a city that has gates and when it closes its doors, people can't get out. And that at those gates, the leaders of this evil kingdom have plans and strategies and devices to keep people forever bound inside that city. That when a person feels hopeless, you don't get hopeless by accident. There's been a strategy to get you to that place. When, when, when you're struggling with addiction, people are not addicted by accident. That there's a strategy to try to get you to that place so that you feel like you have no options to exercise except to continue to use something that medicates yourself or, or confusion where people can't think their way through and they can't see their way forward or fear that absolutely paralyzes them so that they feel like they have no options to exercise or loneliness where you feel completely isolated and disconnected from so many people. And hell, please hear me, hell has a strategy to get every single one of us in a place like that and when we're there, it will try to close those gates so that we are forever stuck in that place. That's what hell wants to do to us today. And this is what Jesus says. He says that the church is actually going to assail those gates and it's going to pummel those gates and it's going to rattle those gates until they are torn off the hinges so that people who are living in that kind of discouragement and isolation and fear can actually be brought out and be rescued. That's the role and the position of the church in the world today. That's why we're here. Now, when we think about it, we think, oh, well, I'm so limited. I've got limited resources. I have limited intellect. I have limited experience. And all of those things are true. And please hear this. God is not limited by our limitations. God is still God. And if we are, so how do we shake the gates of hell? How do we actually do this? Every time you pray for God to intervene in a situation, the gates of hell shake. Every time you share your faith and your story of grace with somebody, the gates of hell begin to shake. Every time you act in generous and kind ways, the gates of hell begin to shake. Every time you lift your voice and worship and praise to God, the gates of hell begin to shake. And the church is responsible to keep shaking those gates and this is Jesus' promise to us. If we keep doing that, those gates will never be able to prevail against the church. They're going to collapse and people are still going to find their way into grace and to faith. That's what we're called to do. So in our culture, of course there are people who struggle with all kinds of things and they feel bound up by them and burdened under them and they don't know how they're going to survive it. And when they think about coming into rooms like this, they often imagine that when they get here, they can't meet our standards, and so they expect to find rejection instead of finding a sanctuary. And in case you don't know what the word sanctuary means, it means a safe place. They're afraid. 
You can look at homes in our community where the lawns are very well mowed and the gardens look very nice and everything is well taken care of, but you can't tell on the outside what's happening on the inside and there are families that are being shredded and torn apart. And when they think about coming into rooms like this, they don't imagine that they will be accepted. They imagine they will be rejected and they imagine that what they will find is judgment instead of finding a sanctuary. The church has to be a place where people discover that the arms of God are reaching out to them. And they can discover that God has actually already done something to address their sin issues. And that their broken hearts can be healed. And that the fact that they can't imagine a day when they will ever laugh again doesn't mean that it will never happen. And just because they're isolated doesn't mean that they can't find a friend. There has to be a place in our world where shame meets grace. And this has to be a place like that. That's why we're here. This is what we do. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, Help us. On our own, we never feel strong enough. We never feel resourced enough. But help us realize today we are not on our own. That you have come to assist us in this invasion and rescue mission. And that people can find a safe place. They can receive your grace and their lives can be forever transformed because of it. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?